this is TWIP. Hey folks, a little something different for you today. I'm here with an old friend of mine, as in I've known him for a long time, not that he's old. <laughs> Daniel Steinhardt is here. Uh, he's from Epson, a little company that, that makes printers that you may have heard about, printers and a bunch of other things. Um, but we're going to, I wanted to have Daniel on to talk about printing um, from the standpoint of the importance of it and how people that, that may be afraid of printing today or somehow said, you know, I don't print. I put all my stuff on Facebook and Instagram and whatever. What's a print? I want to talk about that and get to the, the crux of why people should be printing, especially if you're an advanced amateur beginner or, or, or professional photographer. So Dano Steinhardt, welcome to the program, man. How are you doing? It's great to be here. It's great to see you and your Game of Thrones, um, um, very symmetrical uh, background there. And, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's quite typical. Wait, that, that's for your screenshot. There's for your screenshot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, no, it's good. Um, yeah, thank you. This is this is a brand new setup. People that have been watching the show know that uh, normally that's not my background. Normally my desk is actually flipped and the room is the background. So mm -hmm. trying something different. You got you to mix it up every now and then. Um, so let's let's talk about this. So you're at you're at Epson. So let's talk about you, like the your role at Epson. What what does Dano do at the company called Epson? <laughs> well, my title is marketing manager. Uh, my primary responsibilities uh, are working with the creative professional markets in the marketing things that go along with that. Uh, it's primarily photography, but we certainly work with anybody that's a creative professional, uh, be it a fine artist, an illustrator, and, and other markets. Um, I also do uh, video production and, and because of uh, some of the crazy background I had in the early days of printing, I've been, uh, I, I sometimes uh, uh, been pulled into some color science things related to projection because yeah. of all the pain we went through early in printing. Uh, I can sit in these long, boring international color science meetings and understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah. 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 I definitely want to talk about that. Cause that, you know, we were, we were talking before I clicked the record button about just sort of back in the day, you know, we won't have to go back. You won't have to put a, a timestamp on it, but back in the day, uh, the, the printing experience was, Hey, I got this brand new printer, got my ink in it. I got my, my box of paper and you run your first print through it and it came out magenta. And you're like, oh, okay, let me, what did I do wrong? Okay, and now I got to understand all this stuff. You run another print through it, it comes out yellow. You know, this was me, you know. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, or actually, let's, let's, let's do that a little bit deeper. I want to talk about the, the history of printing itself. You know, like you kind of touched on that a little bit. Back in the day, it was enlargers. Remember those? You know, we had enlargers, uh, black and white, and then we went to color enlargers, which was a little more involved and a little less tolerance of temperature <laughs> and all that. And then today, you know, it's it's file print. So talk to talk to me about sort of the evolution of where things were <laughs> in the digital printing world and where they are today. How much time do we have? <laughs> we, we only have about three days, so make it quick. <laughs> I like to uh, say, you know, um, if you were to take the entire history of photography from uh, Nieps, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, when I took that eight-hour exposure, uh, the French street scene, and to kind of the, the beginning of the digital age, you know, that is like 95% of photography and, and digital, that term is just this little, you know, little flash, a little wink of the eye. And, yeah. and just to put it in perspective, how quickly and things have evolved. But uh, as I've been with Epson a little over 20 years, but I was recruited from the Eastman Kodak company. Oh. And this was when Kodak was Kodak, you know, yeah. uh, amazing company. Kodak moment. Yeah. What it was. So, uh, uh, and before that, I was a commercial photographer. I used to use 8x10 view cameras, shooting food for magazines wow. <laughs> in wow. Chicago. But uh, if you look, just a quick thing in the past, you know, the uh, printing was always about black and white printing. Mm 
And it was not an uncommon thing uh, post-World War II for a lot of hobbyists to have dark rooms and uh, advanced amateurs to do dark rooms. And if you define yourself as a professional photographer, you always had a black and white dark room. Yeah. Color printing, as we know it, we call it now the analog world, and then it was called a color print. <laughs> Uh, you know, that slowly came in the kind of mainstream, well, you know, 60s, 70s, but that was purely big labs, big photo finishing houses. It was difficult. You needed big processors. You needed temperature controls. You needed people and staff, and, and it was always the lab. Yep. And, and it'd be fair to say that traditional C printing, uh, I've never met anyone that said, gosh, I just love the way my C prints used to be, <laughs> you know. There were revered print processes back there like dye transfer. Uh, some people remember Seba Chrome, all these kind of things. And, mm -hmm. But they're just kind of, they're in the past. It's kind of an interesting history lesson. You know, I, I lived it and that's where all this hair went in those dark rooms. <laughs> <laughs> it's still in the dark room. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the first kind of uh, digital printing started really uh, in the early 90s. And I was uh, then a Kodak technical sales representative, which was a revered job, you know, back in the analog days. And my territory were two zip codes in Manhattan, which we now know is the New York City Photo District. You know, all my, all my uh, colleagues around the US, they had cars and they had car phones that were literally screwed into the dashboard. But I had what was called a walking territory because in two zip codes that I could walk the perimeter in 20 minutes, that was the intergalactic center of photography. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. I didn't need a car, but I always wanted one. Anyway, um, we started to see something called an iris printer start to hit the streets. And this is this is kind of the the uh, what is that thing? What uh, no one understood this thing. It was a uh, a printer designed for pre-press proofing markets. Meaning, for those that are not familiar with that, in the old uh, web presses, uh, when you went to make a uh, brochure. Or, or you were proofing a magazine, you needed to create a proof that everyone would sign off on. Some of them were called signature proofs. There were different brand names, but there was so much at stake, so much money involved when you made a brochure to print it, because once you started, you were committed to thousands, tens of thousands. You wanted a proof that would absolutely match. So there was no guessing and didn't have to redo things. So Iris was meant for that. It was this big thing and it had a big rolling drum and it had all this stuff. And at, at the start, uh, there were uh, a musician and the road manager who were really into photography. Uh, you'll know them as Graham Nash of Crosby, Stills and Nash. Mm -hmm. And Mac Holbert, was, who was the road manager for Crosby, Stills and Nash. Both of them had loved photography. Uh, Graham, who uh, has become a good friend, and we don't talk about music, it's always about photography. He would tell you he was doing photography before music when his father introduced him to, you know, I think he got a, a Roloflex, you know, a twin lens reflex, and they went to yeah. the zoo and they went home and they waited till it was dark and put the curtains up and they processed the film and Graham said it, so he was hooked. Like all, all, many of us of a certain age were hooked in the dark room. Yep. Uh, and Graham, it's a long story, but essentially all of Graham's negatives from Woodstock that he shot uh, disappeared, couldn't find them. And, mm -hmm. But they had these proof sheets and someone showed them how they could scan the proof sheets. That was the first time anyone heard the word scan. And then they printed them and Graham talks about how they were amazing and what they would do and, and how did this happen? It was done by a a guy named David Coons, and he was working for Disney and the, the imagination. Some These were geeks, serious geeks you know, in yeah, the yeah. early 90s. And Graham said, you know, I've got to see this machine. I've got to get this thing. And then Graham and Mac, uh, they, well, Graham purchased the, an iris machine. He says it was $126,000. And the first 10 minutes, they voided the warranty because they didn't, they wanted to do good paper. They didn't want to use stuff to mimic what a magazine would be or, you know, what a brochure would be. And they basically uh, took Mac's wife's, uh, or they took his uh, vacuum cleaner and they, they jerry-rigged it on there to pick up all the dust that would come off the paper as the drum would roll. <laughs> and they, they made the first true fine art inkjet prints. 
Uh, there was a computer, but there was no monitor. It was all tape drive. This was, yeah, definitely early, early, early days. <laughs> but the quality drive. was remarkable. The problem was those were dye-based inks. Uh, dye-based inks are, uh, the technical term is fugitive. We would know it as fades, and those things would sometimes fade while you're looking at it. <laughs> it could move really quickly. So wow. there were, there were like, This is great. Wait, this was great. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember shortly after that, and, what, uh, and then they started a business called Nash Editions. It was never meant to be a capitalist, you know, kind of a, we're going to make a lot of money and do stuff. They wanted to evangelize this as a great way to do photography and fine art printing because so many people never loved the C-print. And, you know, a, a photographer, uh, he's recently passed away, but maybe, do you ever know David Steckline? No. He was a great, great uh, photographer of the West, and he was based in Idaho and cowboy. You, you, he, if you see a cowboy image, it was, he, he probably shot it from, you know, 60s, well, yeah, 70s, 80s. But, you know, he was, this was a common thing then. It's not today, but then it was like when you made, had a C-print made in a lab to a commercial photographer, it was always, oh, you know, how do you feel about this? Well, I forgive the lab yet again because there weren't really good options. Now, all of a sudden, there's the promise that the photographer could take control that it wasn't, uh, you know, if you did color printing, it was magenta and yellow, remember? And, and it was, if you try to dodge and burn, you know, the old fashioned way, all of a sudden, wherever you dodged would go magenta, wherever you burned would go green, you know, it's like out of control. And you can make You bring it back masks. my PTSD, man. My PTSD is uh, coming back. <laughs> it was like, all the, all the stuff we learned in black and white just didn't work in color. No, you know? no. They're, Color was like rules and you follow this. And, and remember, you know, you agitate this. And if you go over one quarter of a degree of Fahrenheit and this, you know, and your shift color, it would do this and do that. And I can remember even in school getting some of those prints. You know, we had to make them. In fact, we used to make them in this, uh, it, it was, we used to call it the French fryer. It was this basket system. You would pick up, put the prints in there, and you would dip it between the, remember, the developer and the bleach and all. And, if, uh, and it was always in the dark, so you always had to guess, am I going in the right one? You know, you miss, and then I was like, yeah. It wasn't fun. <laughs> yeah, none of that sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, you would take some of those prints, depending on the manufacturer, all of a sudden you would dry mount them. And then he, they would all of a sudden go cyan because of the heat, all sorts of problems. Anyway, yeah. so uh, kind of in the early 90s to kind of bring it to where we're going, all yeah. of a sudden there were Irish machines everywhere. And uh, the quality was different. You could print for the first time on fine art papers, cotton fiber papers, and all the interesting stuff. There was still this concern about longevity and permanence. I think that company did improve those products uh over time but uh this is about the time epson introduced the first inkjet printer and that that did change the game because now you went from tens of thousands of dollars the first one was hundred you know one hundred twenty six thousand dollars into machines that were then 44 inches wide that were in the five thousand dollar range and then all of a sudden smaller things were coming into play and uh, now you could do it yourself, but it was challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, it still wasn't easy. Yeah, it, it was not easy. There were, uh, I like to see, you know, the term color management is, is you was used very extensively in those days. It'd be fair to say at that time amongst photographers, color management was, and this, this is around the late nineties or kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> it yeah. was not manageable. It was yeah. all over the place. You, yep. There were people involved in, uh, I don't want to sound like, you know, old, you know, I remember this guy, but uh, do you remember Bill Atkinson? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so Bill is this amazing guy at Apple, genius. I, I forgot all this, he did great things, but he loved photography. But he had all these same problems everyone had. So he developed what were known as the Atkinson Profiles which was a target of, I don't know how many different color patches, thousands or whatever. <laughs> because what he was trying to do then, 
if you remember in the analog world, you had a curve shape, you know, black and white was an S curve. In color, it was an S curve for red, green, and blue. And then yeah. in the dark room, if you tried to dodge and burn, well, your your red curve would cross your green curve, and you know, this is you'd have these cross curves, and and it was basically live with it or you know take up you know real estate or fencing. Yeah. So what Bill tried to do is he created all these patches because we still had this kind of um, on these curves they weren't nice and smooth. You know, all of a sudden it would be jagged. All of a sudden the they would dip around. He created profiles to straighten out the curve. I was watching this movie last night. It's an old movie. I like it called Space Cowboys. And mm -hmm. Completely implausible, but you know they're coming in too steep, and because they're on the wrong curve in the trajectory, and that's what Bill's profiles did. They just got them on the curve. <laughs> see, I see how your brain works. <laughs> Printing and and Bruce Willis movies kind of somehow. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> exactly. You're either, you're either going to burn up or you're going to skip off the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And starting, but only then with printing, you can start again with another piece of paper. <laughs> uh, and now it was like, oh, now I can do color. Now these things. Now, and, and then uh, as the technology continued to evolve, evolve, and Epson started producing really good profiles and the printhead technology and the screening algorithms and all sorts of other technical things kept improving and improving. And then color management became mainstream. As I recall, Photoshop 5, mm -hmm. that rev, that is when full color management uh, was possible. Of course, and here was the unfortunate thing then, and we're still living with it a little bit today is all of that color management nomenclature comes from that old pre-press world. Mm -hmm. So things like relative colorimetric for your rendering intent go, you know, that's, <laughs> that's all from newspapers and magazines. Right. Uh, absolute. There's four things there and it's in Photoshop. You'll still see them there. Uh, there's absolute saturation, relative, relative color metric, not just relative and then perceptual. And then people then would go, well, I use perceptual because it helps me perceive the way that I No, It was all from newspapers and absolute meant if you, if you choose absolute, it'll absolutely match. And then I'll sign this and then I'm off the hook. That's where that stuff comes from. Wow. I did not know that. Um, the, the useless information. I, I got more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's all right. It's already filled with useless information. So, so uh, this is more. But, you know, kind of fast forward today. Now we have software that just makes it easier to work with. Uh, you don't have to be a historian. You don't have to be a scientist. You, these are straightforward tools that you can use combined with what Epson's mission has been from from the start of entering the photographic market is to continually evolve and build this amazing technology with the goal that the technology gets out of the way so you can focus on the photography. That's the ultimate yeah. goal for Epson. And whenever we do an exhibition or, you know, we're at a trade show, you know, our ultimate goal is that you can't look at a print and go, oh, I can, that's an Epson print because I can see this, I can see that. We've succeeded when it's all about the photographer and not about Epson. That's fantastic. And that, that's the thing, you know, and, and I think the, that path that you just sort of illustrated, I identify with that because I was in the dark room. I had printers and I remember seeing absolute versus, you know, all, all that stuff. And it was like, ugh. You know, I even remember watching those some of those Graham Nash videos, you know, where he's like explaining fine art, high end glisse printing and all this stuff. I'm like, one day I want to get there. I can do it. I can do it. Um, and I remember back then I was like, I could never it felt like I could never get there. I could never create a print at home that was what I wanted it to be, that I was like, OK, this is the 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 physical representation of what i saw on the screen it was always different and i couldn't figure out why you know, i know there's calibration and all that stuff in there 
Mm-hmm. And then what I want to, I also want to talk about is, you know, the, 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 the well, I was going to say laboratory, the laboratory. My, the my laboratory. wife's British, she'll say that <laughs> along with alum, the laboratory. aluminium. Yeah, <laughs> yeah aluminium, Zed, all that stuff. Uh, but the, the, the difference between having a printer at home, sitting on your, your desktop, kind of like what you have but behind you, a printer at home versus sending a, you know, a TIFF file to your local lab. Let's talk about that a little bit and the differences in the power of having your own printing in your own hand, you know, you know, in your own house versus, you know, f- sending the FTPing the file and waiting five days for it to show up. Where, where do, where do you fall on that? Well, today, um, it'd be fair to say, um, we encourage anybody to print whether they do it themselves or they send it to a service bureau or to a lab. Mm-hmm. Uh, many labs today are using our technology and we encourage people to understand the technology, the name so that they can be a better client for the lab. Hey, I want it on this kind of paper. You should know what it's capable and the labs will appreciate that. So, um, uh, m- well, there, there still are a few labs doing sea prints. You'll still see that primarily in, in the wedding markets. Uh, the advantage there is volume. You know, yeah. that's the one thing okay. about, you know, a sea print, you can still crank out tens of thousands of prints, you know, in a short amount of time. Inkjet, we still have that thing, you know, it's gotten a lot, a lot faster. Uh, right. But as far as uh, maybe for those people watching this that have never printed, uh, there's a couple of things about printing yourself that even if you don't have uh, Frederick and my uh, hairstyle and lost hair in a dark room, <laughs> there was something when you were in a dark room, it was alchemy and there was some magic when you saw that first print, you know, kind of develop in front of your eyes, you know, and it was like, I've created fire. I am an artist. I, you know, there was like this excitement. And to this day, when I see uh, people new to photography, maybe they're in their teens, 20s, and they're making their first digital print, it's that same level of excitement of, oh my God, you know, when you see this thing coming out of the printer, it's that same level of excitement. Yeah, Uh, something you made. Yeah. You know, you don't necessarily get that kind of joy and excitement when you upload something to the web or Instagram. It, it's still, that's pretty cool. But there's something special when you have some kind of two-dimensional, uh, three-dimensional object in your hands that you've created. So there's that level. Printing, I have found, this is me personally, I'm biased, I'm the Epson guy, so you'll have to filter that out. <laughs> um, I think printing makes you a better photographer. Because when you, uh, it's the same kind of comparison from those that do uh, video production and and still. Uh, And I do both. Still photographers can make the transition to video, but video people sometimes struggle going to still because in still, we're laser focused on that, that border, on the lighting and the details and the contrast and color and everything. With, with motion, things move around and there's other things going on and, and you're telling stories and, and that's all great. Uh, but when you have a print, it forces you to slow down and look. And when you look, uh, sometimes you go, oh, I didn't see that before. <laughs> I should you know, need to edit the image, need to do things. Next time I can do this better. Um, gee, I, I can, the old analog things kick in. Oh, maybe I should vignette and bring the uh, corners in more. I want to draw my attention here. You have, you, the print kind of makes you, I think, that better storyteller. I agree. I agree. It's kind of like when you, like if you're writing a letter or you're writing some copy or something, you could stare at it on the screen all day long and write, 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 write. But until, for me at least, till I print it out, and then hold that printed piece of paper in front of me and read it. I'm like, how, what, how did I say the, the, and who talks like that? Right. <laughs> it's, like, it's the same thing. You could be in Photoshop all day long and perfecting Lightroom, you know, perfecting your image, you print it out and you're like, 
what the heck? You know, and you got to go back. Yeah, so I agree. Definitely. My, my color <laughs> science background would say, well, you're, you're dealing with transmitted uh, electromagnetic radiation versus, you know, reflective art. And big, big. There's just something about you're looking at it here and you see things differently. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I would encourage those that uh, younger people have never printed, there's a, a certain joy, and it's a little bit of an ego thing, when you show those prints to other people and they hold the print, there's something tactile about that experience that says, ooh, now, depending on who you are, I, I never knew you had it in you. you know? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Oh, you're um, a real photographer. You made a print. <laughs> there's a certain <laughs> level of that. At a pro level, uh, it used to be if you wanted to get work in uh, print advertising, there's less of that these days, but you would yeah. send to an ad agency the book. Now, the book met your portfolio, mm -hmm. and a portfolio is usually, it was all over the place, These big leather cases or some little small things, a whole variety of things, and people tried to outdo themselves with the presentation of the book. And a lot of inkjet printing became this great way to show the book versus, you know, even earlier when you, people would shoot on chrome and, you know, hold up a chrome to the light and go out the window, go, oh, this looks kind of blue, you know, that kind of thing. Today, you can send the book on a tablet, and many people do. I was talking with a, a very famous celebrity photographer who was up for a job, major ad agency in New York, and he always sends the book, the printed book. Yeah. And he was up against a bunch of other people who sent tablets. And he said, you know how I got the job? I sent the prints. Because an image on a tablet, on a phone, on the web, people tend to do this. Yep, yep, well, that's nice, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. When you have a print, they slow down and they look at it. Yeah, yeah. You can't physically do that, with, but you, you look at it. And, and and then if you really want to have the effect, you, you uh, send cheap white cotton gloves. Well, it's important. You know, and you place the print very carefully. It might be a little yeah. overkill for them. Uh, and it, it kind of gives that little extra, this is important stuff. This is crafts. This is a craft. It's not weight like to everybody it, right? else. It's yeah. it has weight to it. It's real. It, it's it's not just existing in the matrix. It's out of the matrix in the in the <laughs> in the real world. Dan, I want to have you talk a little bit about quality. So you talked about the iris, you know, those those hundred thousand dollar, then tens of thousand dollar iris printers and all that. Contrast those that level of quality from those machines with what we have available today. Um, and then the third piece of that equation is lab printing, which may also, like you said, have Epson printers in there as well. If, if I am a consumer and I'm looking and I'm like, yeah, I, you're right, I need to start printing at home. Am I compromising by getting uh, you know, a reasonably priced home printer versus sending my images out to a lab or versus what I would get a couple of decades ago from an iris printer? Well, um, just to uh, give us a little foundation, if we're talking about, uh, say, printers like uh, the new Epson P700, P900, these are 13-inch, 19-inch printers, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily the retail, you know, all-in-one printers that you would see, even though the quality of those is just pretty good. Yeah, it's but, pretty good, yeah. Uh, but if you get into this uh, level of printer, uh, let's say the 13-inch ones, P700, you know, these are about, uh, they're under, that one's about $800, you know, MSRP. The quality of that print, and you can make a 13 by 19 inch cut sheet size. You can also do rolls if you wanted to. It's, it's, it's very difficult to define it technically. I like to give the correlation to, if we think back to the analog world. So this print, uh, produced with this $800 printer that will cost, you know, a couple of dollars with ink and, and uh, paper is vastly superior to a print that was produced with about a half a million dollars of equipment and a staff of five people. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say, I can't, you know, it's good, but it's like, I, I was... Uh, during these interesting times we're in, I was cleaning out my um, attic and I came across stuff. 
<laughs> stuff that I thought was amazing and that is now not amazing technically. <laughs> really horrible yeah. stuff. Uh, and I just look at what these things can do and the control that you have. You know, in the old days it was, well, if you, you, you went to a lab and it was like, do you want a glossy or matte? And that was it. Now you have uh, all this uh, control and you have all of this choice. Um, yeah. And so quality wise and the things you can do and the technology itself is much easier. So mm -hmm. for someone new and they want to print at home, uh, there's some a new software we have, which is for free called Epson Print Layout. Simple, just follow the steps top to down, top to down. <laughs> and uh, it just works now. You know, and all the, it's basically, it's all the pain that we all went through 15 years ago. It's all fixed, it's all solved. And you have some choices to make. Oh, what paper would you like? What size would you like? Uh, there's still that, that uh, perceptual relative thing, but I have an easy fix for that one. And uh, you'll make a print that'll be remarkable. Now, the print's only going to be as good as who the photographer is. Sure. I like to tell people the printers are amazing technological wonders, but they're only as good as the file that you send to it. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's amazing. That this it, it's ringing in my head that the, the prints that you can get today rival those gazillion dollar machines of years gone by and, and all that, that is just, right. you know, it, from, from somebody that has walked over those coals, you know, it's just like, okay. <laughs> but also, it should have been, my brain back then was like, how come this just doesn't work? I just want to make a print of that that's on the screen to that over there, and it should look very similar. How do I get there? And it was hard, and now it's not, right? But also, if you, you want to, uh, for whatever reason, you don't want to print at home, you don't have the time, or and you want to go to a lab, you can get that same level of quality. Uh, it's just, again, understand the technology, what's available, so that you can direct the lab as to what you want. But uh, when, you're in, when you're driving, when you've got the mouse, you, you don't need a mouse to print, but it helps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or a tablet, you know. Or, um, you're in control, and you can do things uh, that you could never do in the darkroom, uh, but it's also, it's hard sometimes to explain to others, I want this, I want this, I want this, when you can just very simply do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you want to be quick and serendipitous, like, oh, I got people over, I want to give them a print of this thing, you know, and, and share it right then. Um, you know, there's a couple of uh, directions, and we're, we're good on time, right? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things I wanted to chat about. The... You know, today we've got the, a, a ton of people, and we talked about this a little bit before, we've got a ton of people that are on Instagram and they're using Instagram as their main distribution mechanism for the photography that they do. It goes from, you know, from photons to the camera sensor to the memory card to Instagram, rinse and repeat and nothing in between. <laughs> what those people that are doing that what from from Epson's standpoint how do they inter, how do they interact or how do they interject the world of physical atoms versus electrons into their their workflow like what would you suggest for those people that are doing that workflow over and over and shooting for the likes you know and the hearts on Instagram <sighs> Well, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago that the only way you could see what you photographed was to make a print. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that's yeah. changed, you know, from a variety of different ways. And uh, yours truly is uh, all over Instagram. I love it. Uh, yeah. it. It coexists with everything that we do. Uh, for those that have only known Instagram or only see the value in it, uh, we're finding that, especially as more and more people are on Instagram and it's harder and harder to get followers and, and uh, get lo uh, likes or segregate from the rest mm -hmm. that um, several of those people find that there's a new income stream by selling prints. And, uh, and Instagram is becoming more of a profit center is maybe not the right word, but more and more photographers, that is their their primary mission yeah, and they get work from that 
but also, uh, and they're looking for sponsorship and, you know, but the more followers you get, then you can build a certain audience and you can do different things, but that's getting harder and harder to do as a photographer. So yeah. we're seeing a lot of those people actually uh, selling prints now and using their followers to get the word out about those prints. For the, for the folks that are, that, you know, speaking to the, yeah, I don't even want to say, I don't even think it's a generational thing, but you know, the back in the day it was, you know, desktop computers, Quadra 950s, remember the Quadra Max and all this stuff. Um, and then it kind of segued into portable computers and, and MacBook Pros and all that. And then today, you know, a lot of younger people are like, you know, I don't even own a computer. I do everything on my phone and on a tablet. You know, if I really want to get serious, I'll use a tablet. Talk about that word a little bit. Is, is Epson like sort of addressing those people that may do the majority of their photo editing on mobile and portable devices? Because these, these devices, especially iPads, are, you know, more powerful than a lot of the Quadra 950s or all of the Quadra 950s well, back in the day. a lot more powerful, for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, we we recently uh, took uh, Epson Print Layout, the software that's been available on the desktop, and we just introduced uh, mobile versions of it for both iPad and for iPhone. Right right now it's uh, iOS only. Uh, we're looking at you know the other platform, uh, but yes, and it takes all of the ease and the simple way to approach printing that we do on the desktop with Epson Print Layout and allows you to do that uh, on the iPad, where at least my observations, these are just, here's a little insight. So yep. at Epson, you know, we have a research department and they'll run statistical studies and for uh, your viewers that you know, they run all the right things. And whenever I see N minus one, I go, oh, yeah, okay, it's gonna get serious. You know? <laughs> but uh, I, I, as the marketing manager, I'm out in the field and I see people and there's this term uh, that our research department has coined called Danicdotal, a play on anecdotal. Well, Danicdotally, we're seeing this. It, it's always correct, but they can't statistically prove it. <laughs> I love that. I'm using that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> it's anecdotal. You know. But Danicdotally, we're seeing um, a lot of people that are uh, artists, graphic designers. Really, the, the tablet is almost their primary computer. Yeah. And some photographers, the tablet becomes a much, is there, they've gone from desktop to laptop to notebook to that. The yeah. phone uh, is slowly becoming a more professional device, but there's also a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of selfies and fun stuff, you know, sure. on the sure. phone. But the phone is also becoming a device. So, so yeah, that we're seeing that and we're making this, software available to do that I, I was going to see if there's a way i could demo it here but i don't think so <laughs> i mean I can yeah, show you how yeah. it looks, but it's not gonna look too good but yeah, i will uh, link to it i'll link to it from the blog post for sure i mean i have a little powerpoint thing here i could show you how it works but it it absolutely works and i i i and uh, my colleagues inside we beta or alpha test these products and we, we were looking at this several months ago Honestly, I thought, oh, wow, F fully color managed uh, software workflow on the phone, you know? Yeah, it works. It, it, it does. works. See, that's so interesting because I, I like, you know, we were talking offline a little bit about the, the twitch.tv or um, community over there and there's a vibrant community of younger photographers well you know it, it's the there's a lot of uh, across the spectrum of photographers but there's a lot of there's a contingent of younger photographers that are in there and some of them are using ipads as their primary you know mm -hmm. way of editing their images it goes in, in editing wedding work on just an ipad and it sure. looks fantastic on there and i as an old guy i go in there i'm like really <laughs> come on in my day you had we had all our photos were on punch cards and we <laughs> 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 that's not a real that's not real <laughs> photography on ipad but in all seriousness <laughs> the work looks every bit as good and in some cases yeah. better than anything that you'd see on a, on a traditional desktop or laptop computer. So sure. yeah, kudos should, to Epson for addressing that. I should say just a, um, 
that the uh, Epson print layout for iPhone and iPad at this time only works on the new P700 and P900, 13 inch okay. printer, 17 inch printer. Uh, the desktop version works on a lot more printers, but this is, you know, it's basically recently launched and, and it's out there. Uh, and, and the software, this is the best part, software is free. <laughs> well, 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 let's let's talk about the product line a little bit because um, I'm I'm curious. We talk about there's a lot of options, obviously, for photographers. There's a grid matrix in terms of, you know, uh, papers and and you know everything. You know, you could pick what you want, and it's easier to get from image that's in your mind's eye or in Photoshop or Lightroom out to the printed surface to you know to to present uh but what does that look like in terms of cost for the photographer you know from a from an enthusiast that's not making money from photography but wants to print and maybe hang stuff on the wall all the way through to the the pro commercial fashion wedding shooter that wants to do that needs to do you know maybe not volume work but they need to print a couple you know a hundred images and they all need to look good what's the lineup for those people um, well, to think in terms of size, <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, and printers come 13 inches wide, 17 inches wide, that's kind of the desktops. Uh, and then you go to 24 inches wide, 44 inches wide, up to 64 inches wide. I, I don't, wow. th 64 is, that's a big deal. Now you're back into what it was like 20, you know, and, and the, the, <laughs> these printers are amazing. They're not that big. And you think, wow, that's great. Until the print starts coming out and you go, where are we going <laughs> to put this thing? <laughs> <It's huge. laughs> I need another room to hang my prints. <laughs> um, it, you know, rather than going to all the, all the MSRP of all these kind of printers, the way I like to think of it is the, the 13 inch is kind of that entry level, getting going, learning from it. Uh, but it's the 17 inch printer that's kind of the sweet spot because it started out as, oh, if you're of a certain age, I'm, I'm nowhere near as old as you, but, you know, no, if you're yeah. a certain age, uh, there was the big, the print that was the, the creme de la creme was 16 by 20. If you could do 16 by 20 in the dark room, cause anything bigger was a nightmare. And the 17 inch printer, which really can do cut sheets 17 by 22, does the 16 by 20. There's just something about that size. I did make a couple just to show you. I don't know if you'll see this now. So this is a oh, 17 man. by 22 print. Oh. This is on the legacy texture paper printed on the, the new P900. And here's a 13 inch print. This is on a glossier paper, which is still terrific size. Uh, and that's, you know, but there's something about when you get to this size, um, it's nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? that is nice. And that it's very versatile and allows you to do things. And uh, and of course, there's there's letter size prints, and, you know, and those are great. But in some ways, the way to think about it, if you're into photography, and yeah, you're going to buy a printer. Yeah, you're going to be buying some ink and some paper. I like to think of it as it's kind of like buying a, a good lens for your camera. It's about the same price point, uh, depending on what lens, what camera. We could have big arguments about that one. But it's actually, and depending, it could be a little less, it could be a little bit more. But think of it as buying, you're buying a lens as far as, you know, kind of total cost. Uh, and then you're in business. Uh, and if you can sell prints, then it, it pays for itself or it doesn't, but also utilizing the built-in color management stuff. Uh, there used to be an old joke in the old days that, oh, Epson doesn't want this color management to work because people are going to burn through a lot of ink and paper trying to get a decent print. Uh, our goal is not that. Our goal is, sure, we want you making a lot of prints, but we want each one of those prints to be exactly what you wanted and have yeah. that experience not wasting anything and it does that today that. you know i love that i'm sure so in there. your days you made a print and it was like Ugh. and then you probably put on your old analog roots oh it's magenta so you start chasing your tail oh i'm gonna go i'm gonna put green in there you put green in there and then this guy you know it's like my golf swing it's a series of compensating errors <laughs> yep yep yeah. roy g biv right roy g biv <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Those days were over. <laughs> yeah, I, I I literally had above my printer and by the workstation the the color star with you know you know the, with the colors on there. So, oh, you were using a, yeah, you were using a ring around. Yeah, you're. Oh yeah. You remember the ring around? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I saw it in a history book. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so crazy. So crazy. Hey, Dad. While I have you, I have a I have a question. I'm hoping you can you know, mm-hmm. apply some Epson official logic to this argument. So oh. in the TWIP Pro community, there's been an ongoing discussion about presentation of prints. And should you, and the gist of it is some people think that every print you create should have a border on it. You know, within Photoshop, you should put a black border or a white border and maybe even a key line around the image because mm-hmm. it, it presents the image better. There's another camp. I'm not going to tell you which camp I'm in. You probably can guess. But there's another camp that says the print should be the print. And if you want to add presentation to it, that should be done in the real world with physical mats and physical frames. Where, where do you fall on that? You know, you, Dano, I know it's subjective. You, Dano, personally, where do you fall on that? Uh, it, well... As long as it's a print, I, I don't. I'm not <laughs> as long as you're printing, I don't care what you do with the pixels. <laughs> I would say, if you were to come to a, a trade show where we're exhibiting, when we can exhibit again, right now we're doing things virtually, uh, and I manage all of that in photo trade shows. Uh, each one of those prints is simply and elegantly framed with a consistent, simple mat. Yes. Um, in that case, I have to, I do have to stay within certain constraints on size based on trade show properties. So what I want to do is maximize the size of the print. Frankly, it shows off what Epson technology can do. Uh, and then I will use these, the software I was talking about to get the size I need exactly to get as much, as large as I can get and fit with the mat and things I want to do. But if you're a person that likes deckled edges or you like to use stroke lines or you like to have multi things or you print on canvas and you do wraps and it, some people like mirror wraps and some people like blurry wraps and some people like solid wraps. Um, if you're printing that's the important thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Good answer. Good answer. That's right on the line. You know, very, very Dano right there. It's perfect. Perfect. All right. Here's, uh, here's a little, here's a little hint. Yeah. And there, and it comes a little bit from my color science background and how human vision works. And it's just something to keep in mind it, that it does relate to borders. And for those people who like those big white borders, I'm not making any judgment, but you should be aware that as uh, human beings, <clears throat> we are innately uh, drawn to highlights and contrast. And if you uh, print with very large white borders, it will, at, at the limbic system of our anatomy, make your print look a little darker because essentially when you have that much white surround your eye is stopping down like an f-stop yeah yeah Yeah. that may be appropriate and i always find when i'm doing that and, and if i can't control the lighting i have to make the print and there's a need for a white border i have to make the actual image area a little lighter to compensate for the effect of that white surround does a reverse happen if you put a black border on there? The in, yeah. the print just looks darker, and your eyes open up a little bit. It's no different. I hate talking like I'm an old man, but you know, in the old days, <laughs> own it, man. Come on, I've I've owned it. Just own it. <laughs> the concept is the same. When we used to shoot transparency film, eight by ten magazines, chromes. Remember those? The way you you would you know, do this shoot the way you would impress the art director was you turn off all the lights in the studio and you would put the chrome on top of the light box and then you would put matte black mask all around it so that chrome just glowed and you go wow look at all that stuff then came the the angry phone call a couple weeks later 
when it printed so dark in the magazine. Because when you see how they printed magazines, they would take that chrome, put it in the light box next to a light banging down on it. And that's where that old four-stop photography, you know, the, the a chrome could hold this much information, but the print could only do this. And where do you, so, so yes, uh, same concept. I but a print, you have more control. So uh, yes, beware of the big white border because it could distract from your image. I love that. I love that. Sage words, sage words. So I want to give you the, I want to give you the last word on this, Daniel. So the, there's a, um, there's a saying, I forget who said it. You, you will know who said, it, I'm sure. But, uh, I don't know if it was Ansel Adams or someone, but they said that the print is the punctuation at the end of the sentence. Where do you fall in that? Is, is the print the punk, especially, and I know you work at Epson, so of course, you know, you're going to say, yeah, but, but just like when you look at it from the standpoint of, you know, we're in 2020, moving into 2021 and most images are shared online, but since we've been talking, millions of images have been shared online, right? So most images are shared online in the context of all that. Is that still true? Is it still true that the print, the physical embodiment of the pixels in the file on your screen, the sentence is not finished until you output it to atoms? Where do you, where do you feel, fall on that? Uh, well, I, honestly, I, I use Instagram. I love it. You can look at my site. Uh, we use it all the time. I, for me personally, I, I kind of fall back on my mentor, who is Jay Mazel. I've and, heard of him. <laughs> and Jay, when he was, Jay has many things but to say. But, but when it comes to the print, he said it's the print in which you can build your reputation. I love it. I love it. And, All I, right, and I always remember that. Yeah, I love that. I love it. Daniel Steinhardt, <laughs> where, where can people go to... Uh, see your work or to connect and see these, all these Epson printers, et cetera? What's, a, what's the best place for them to go? Well, the most important thing is to go to uh, the Epson site, which for photography is printyourlegacy.com. Oh. And you will see the entire um, Epson uh, professional printers and uh, media, signature-worthy media and legacy papers. And then uh, we also have a YouTube channel that I've put together to teach people about some of these things, how to use the, the latest software. And that's a YouTube channel and it's epson.com uh, forward slash print academy. And two more <laughs> are the, the new Epson Pro Instagram site we started it's exclusively for the professional community that we've encouraged many of your viewers to follow and join and be part of. And that is at Epson Pro Photography. Pro Photography. And then if you're really bored, you know, you could look at my Instagram, <laughs> <laughs> which is Dano underscore at Dano underscore Steinhardt. But, Steinhardt. Uh, I it. think the, uh, the other stuff's more informative. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we'll go in that order. You know, Epson, Epson, printyourlegacy.com, the YouTube channel, Epson.com slash print academy. And then uh, follow Epson at Epson Photography, at Epson Photography. And then at, lastly, at if you Pro have time, yeah. Epson, what is it? Epson Pro Photography? It's at Epson Pro Photography. That's the Got Instagram it. handle. And, and mine is at Dano underscore. Steinhardt, where you'll see all the all the images that I like to say were taken between meetings, which is true. These are all things I've shot between meetings while I'm collecting all that Danicdotal information. <laughs> you should have named your Instagram account Danicdotal. Come on, just, come on. I'm gonna I'm gonna go register that right now. No, I'm okay. just kidding. All right. well, yeah. We'll go 50 50 huh? <laughs> there you go there you go I'll, I'll i'll register it and then trade it for a printer there you go <laughs> there you go you're like what am i laying around here cool well dano thank you for doing this man i appreciate your time today this has been informative i'm excited uh about printing uh, and i'm excited that that how well, obviously Epson is serious about printing, but I'm excited about how serious Epson is about the reducing the the pain between what you see on the screen and what you see in the prints, because we as photographers, we just want to see 
what we created in Photoshop come to life on a print and not have to be technicians in the middle of all that. So yeah, thank you and kudos to Epson for that. Great, thank you. All right, take care, Dana. This is Twitter.